Indoors, we tried an experiment outside. I don't know if I like the sound or not. My friend Todd is going to let me know. I prefer the sound indoors, but uh, staying cooped up all the time is a problem for me, too. This process is similar, petrified fossils, to that of the formation of a mold and subsequent cast in that it consists of detailed replacement of the organic material by mineral water, usually brought about by the action of underground water. <clears throat> Sounds kind of haphazard to me. The famous petrified forests of the Yellowstone Park region and of Arizona are familiar examples of this process. The exact details of this process of petrifaction are not known. Although the usual associations of petrified wood and other materials indicate that volcanic action has been a contributing factor, the petrified forest of Arizona, as well as other regions, also show also shows action of subsequent floodwaters as a probable agent of deposition of the materials in their present location. I remember when I made a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I stopped off at a small petrified forest and I got some petrified wood. I was amazed. In any case, some sort of catastrophic agent is again necessary for at least the burial of the materials before the agencies of petrification can begin their work. Again, it's haphazard <coughs> and dependent upon a lot of random things, maybe on a huge and catastrophic scale. In any case, the preservation of animal and human tracks is another point. This is Professor Miller's last category of means of fossil preservation. Many thousands of tracks of animals of all kinds have been found preserved in stone, including many tracks of dinosaurs and other creatures now extinct. We just looked at that, the Burdick Trail uh, and the Glen Rose, Texas, the, uh, the river there. Professor Miller says, footprints of animals made in moderately soft mud or sand, sandy mud, which soon harden, plural, and becomes covered with more sediment, are especially favorable for preservation. Thousands of examples of tracks of great extinct reptiles have been found in the red sandstone of the Connecticut River Valley alone. This sort of thing has been found so frequently that it has been considered more or less normal. Dinosaur footprints, for example, were discovered in Paluxy, uh, in the Paluxy River river bed in Glen Rose, Texas. These dinosaur tracks were supposedly made over 100,000, 100 million years ago in a river bed now identified as formed in the supposed, I like the word supposed there, Cretaceous periods. The presumption is the fossil record and the rocks that are embedded with those fossils are accurately and, 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 and uh, reliable. And then they name the period. And they, they make no bones about it. This is 100,000 and nothing above it or below it occurs then. This is only exclusive to it. Wow. Aside from the remarkable and hardly believable claim that such ephemeral markings could have been preserved in such fine detail for such a long time, it is particularly significant then in the same bed have been found what appear to be human footprints. I put in brackets myself. Further investigation which follows proves that they are indeed human, fully human, homo sapien, relative, related to human tracks that have been thus preserved are the many instances of preservation of ancient ripple marks or raindrop impressions. <coughs> but that such ephemeral markings could have been preserved in such great numbers and in such perfection is truly a remarkable phenomenon and one for which there is little, if any, modern parallel. It is a matter of common experience that impressions of this sort in soft mud or sand are very quickly obliterated. It seems clear that the only way in which such prints could be preserved as fossils is by means of some chemical action permitting rapid burial. 
all kinds of chemicals are going around with all that water, worldwide flood, but it's never considered. Some sudden and catastrophic action is again necessary for any reasonable explanation of the phenomenon. For example, there is no case of the human footprints that have frequently been found in supposedly very ancient strata that don't indicate that humans should be there. Men, of course, man, of course, is supposed to have evolved only in the so-called late tertiary. Fix that. Oh, I guess not. It's the right place. And at the earliest, and therefore, to be only about one million years old. But what appear to be human footprints have been found in rocks from as early as the so-called Carboniferous period, supposedly some 250 million years old, says Ingalls. On sites reaching from Virginia and Pennsylvania through Kentucky, Mississippi, Illinois, Missouri rather, and westward toward the Rocky Mountains, prints similar to those shown above, referring to accompanying pictures, which I didn't have the option to get here, and from 5 to 10 inches long, have been found on the surface of exposed rocks, and more and more keep turning up as the years go by. Albert C. Ingalls, The Carboniferous Mystery. Of course, all of these evolutionists, geologists, and so on, never seem to consider the plausibility of a worldwide flood. These prints give every evidence of having been made by human feet at a time when the rocks were soft mud. As indicated in the quotation, this sort of thing is not a rare occurrence, but is found rather frequently. Never in the textbooks, though. However, geologists refuse to accept the evidence at face value, because it would mean either that modern man lived in the earliest years of the postulated evolutionary history, or that this history must be considered to a duration measured by the history of man. Neither alternative is acceptable. And they've been so successful getting everybody to believe this stuff. I'm convinced, though, that if you don't want to believe in a great, great God creator of the universe, and what the Bible says, you'll believe anything. Ingalls says, if a man, if man, or even his ape ancestor, wow, he says that? Or even that ape ancestor's early mammalian ancestor, existed as far back as in the so-called Carboniferous period, in any shape, then the whole science of geology is so completely worn that all the geologists will resign their jobs and take up track, truck driving. That's what he says. So that's what's at stake. Hence, for the for present at least, science rejects the attractive explanation that man made these mysterious prints in the mud of the Carboniferous period with his feet. Engels and others have tried to explain the prints as modern Indian carvings. Of course, you've got one thing that I actually saw. I saw that big, huge chunk of rock cut out from the riverbed Paluxy River in where I went down to that museum. It took me hours to get there from where I lived in Dallas, Texas, and saw that rock. And they showed they sh they they sawed through where the toes were as well. They took that huge chunk of rock and set it up there on the on the display, and then they sawed through the toes just to see, measured it, looked at it with a microscope to see if they could have carved those toes and the mud impressions right in between, but they were so microscopically perfect as if the foot went into the ooze, all those little bubbles of air going through, they were still there in the rock. So they had to be, couldn't be carved. They had to be real. So as prints made of some as yet undiscovered carboniferous amphibian. Such explanations illustrate the methods by which the uniformitarians can negate even the most plain and powerful evidence in opposition to their philosophy. Nevertheless, it is obvious that it is only the philosophy and not the objective scientific evidence that would prevent one from accepting these prints as of true human origin. Some 
Remarkable footprints have been found in the so-called Cretaceous limestone formation near Glen Rose, Texas, which I alluded to. Roland T. Byrd, a paleontologist from the American Museum of Natural History, carefully examined the rocks and reported as follows. Yes, he said, they apparently were real enough. Real as rock could be, the strangest things of their kind I had ever seen. I don't know, what, that, what does that even mean? On the surface of each <clears throat> was splayed the near likeness of a human foot. What do you mean near likeness? It's either near or it isn't. Perfect in every detail. Wow, okay. But each imprint was 15 inches long. You see any basketball players with 15 inch long feet? Roland T. Bird, Thunder in His Footsteps, Natural History, May 1939. Okay. People back in the old days, apparently according to the Bible, were a lot bigger than they are today. Bird personally investigated the riverbed from which these footprints had reportedly been cut. He saw the same rock cut I did and was told by James Riles, a property owner, that a whole trail of these man tracks had been washed away recently. Bird goes on to say in his article, my surprise was partly overcome by Riles' quite casual reference to them as human footprints. I smiled. No man had ever existed in the age of the reptiles. Riles could only show him one such track, 15 inches long. Bird goes on to say, but the track lacked definition in which to base conclusions. However, he insisted that dinosaur tracks could still be found in the riverbed. To his utter amazement, Bird discovered not only the trails of large three-toed carnivorous dinosaurs, but also the footprints of a gigantic sauropod, 24 by 38 inches, 12 feet apart, and sunk very deeply in the mud. They kept looking back at that Biloxi River bed, because it went under, and they found a hidden area which was covered up with jungle and dirt and soil over the many, many years, and that was washed away in a rainstorm or something, and they saw more tracks in the stone, in the rock, just like the ones they found before. See also R.T. Bird, we captured a live brontosaur, brontosaur, National Geographic magazine. In spite of all this, Bird dismissed the large human footprints as clever carvings. Wow. Three, these tracks, dinosaur and human, were, however, both cut from the Paluxy River bed near Glen Rose, Texas, in supposedly Cretaceous strata, plainly disproving the evolutionist contention that the dinosaurs were extinct some 70 million years before man evolved. Geologists have rejected this evidence, however, preferring to believe that human footprints were carved by some modern artist, dozens of them, while at the same time accepting the dinosaur prints as genuine. If anything, the dinosaur prints looked more artificial than the human because their weight was heavier and things came about where it was covered up and then human footprints had more of a mushy thing to, to set their feet in, uh, in because well, the humans evidently followed the dinosaur tracks to make their their travel easier. And there were in the dinosaur prints, evidently, there was some uh, sediment there that it, uh, collapsed into the, the, uh, that work, and dinosaur, the humans, shortly thereafter, a matter of days, maybe, uh, they, 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 because one set into not the artificial rocks, but the actual uh, dinosaur footprints in the mud, muck, of the riverbed, when it was mud and muck, and not uh, stone. So, uh, and uh, so, the human footprints were in in the dinosaur footprints in the same contemporary time period of time, maybe days apart. So the jet, the uh, the the uh, dinosaur footprints were covered up with a little mud and sediment, and the human footprints in there. So the dinosaur footprints footprints might have looked a little more artificial because uh, se several days of sediment covered them, and the humans followed through when the when the uh, the riverbed was lower. But the genuineness of neither would be questioned at at all were it not for a geologically sacrosanct evolutionary timescale, which they couldn't produce evidence for anyway with their circular reasoning. In summary, we have seen that the preservation of organic materials as fossils by whatever means requires some sort of catastrophic condition, some quick kind, kind of quick burial by engulfing sediments, usually followed by some abnormal chemical means of rapid solidification. This is there is little wonder, then, that it is so different, difficult to find any remains of the modern era which could be said to be in the process of becoming fossils. 
These, those that are found, are invariably so situated as to indicate that they too have been buried by some sudden flood or volcano.